Hello and welcome to my channel In Search of Wonder. My name is Anne and this is the Feb Regency tag. I am very excited today to be doing the Feb Regency tag. Thank you very much to Dia at Novel Idea for tagging me. And I love Feb Regency. It's one of my favorite readathons in the whole calendar year on BookTube. And um, this Regency, Feb Regency tag is one that really makes you think. There are a lot of good questions in this one and I had to ponder some of them at length to come up with my answers. So um, let's get started with question number one. Name your top three Regency authors. I feel like, and I might be wrong about this, but I feel like the field of Regency authors is not as deep as later periods. Um, so I think there aren't as many, at least not as many whose works are widely recognized and widely available, uh, but I could be wrong about that. Um, not that it wasn't a time of great, um, literature and writing. There definitely was, there were, there were quite a few that like rose to the top. Um, you know, books and, um, writers, poets, etc. I'm thinking like Lord Byron and Jane Austen are like perennial favorites. Um, but as far as the field being very deep, I feel like a lot of those authors have largely been lost to time as far as your average reader goes. So anybody but, you know, someone who is really ardently interested in the period wouldn't have as many to pick from. All of that to say, um, I personally haven't read a great deal of Regency authors. So I'm going to mention three that I definitely have read and have really enjoyed. Of course, Jane Austen. I mean, she's just my favorite author in general, and she happened to live in the Regency era. So I love her wit and her humor and her, um, her stories, her characters. Like I just, of all of the authors I have read, the characters that Jane Austen created are ones, and this is why I think her works have been so, such perennial favorites. Her characters are so real you feel like you could know them and you want to, like you want to like be their friend, the heroines, you know, and you want to um, just sit and talk with them about life and things that happen in their book. So um, definitely Jane Austen is a huge one. Um, another one that I have read and enjoyed is Fanny Burney, who definitely lived through the Regency era, but I'm not sure that her novels were written actually during that time. I think her novels actually predate the Regency era by a little bit, but I have read a couple of her novels, um, Evelina and uh, Cecilia, I believe. Um, I think that's the name of the one. I really liked um, Evelina. I thought it was funny. Uh, definitely in a very different vein from Jane Austen, who really was a fan of Fanny Burney, um, but also very enjoyable. And then um, I, think, I think her works kind of edged more towards satire even than Jane Austen did. I mean, Jane Austen was definitely was uh, poking fun and um, pointing out the ironies of various aspects of the English class system of the time. But I feel like Fanny Burney was a little more on the edge satirically. And then Mariah Edgeworth was more of a straightforward storyteller um, and um, her, she was definitely much more focused on writing about social ills and um, errors of the English nobility and uh, things of that nature. And I have also read two of hers. I, I found that the characters in her story were very interesting and uniquely drawn and um, memorable. And I... And I feel like their their characters and their personalities and uh, the things that they went to, anyway, it, it, in many respects, were very relatable even to modern day. Not all of them, but definitely some of them stood out to me in that way as being still kind of fresh even now, um, a couple hundred years after the books were written. So that's question number one. Question number two is name your top Regency, top three Regency poets. And I was thinking really long and hard about this one and I didn't have a good answer because I haven't really spent enough time with any one particular Regency poet to be able to say, oh, that's my favorite. Oh, I love all of their poetry. Um, I have read 
like a wide smattering of poetry from across the scope of Regency poets. Um, but I've not, I've not sat with any of them long enough to really develop like a love for all of their work. So instead, I just picked three Regency poems that I enjoy. And they're not very long ones, so um, I can actually just read them. Um, the first one is, of course, George Gordon, Lord Byron. I mean, you can't talk about Regency poets without mentioning Byron. Um, and also, this is, uh, I'm not breaking any literary ground, guys, here. <laughs> this is one of his very well-known poems that I have always loved. She Walks in Beauty. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place, and on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. So that's Myron. And then um, William Cooper, who I like his hymn, hymns, which are um, a type of poetry. Hymn writing has its own set of structures and rules and types, but it's, it's a subset of poetry overall. It's just one that not many people think of as poetry, but it's definitely poetry. And the people who wrote hymns were not musicians by and large, they were poets. And William Cooper is one of them. And I um, don't actually love what I have read of his regular poetry, but his hymns, I really love. And one of them is, um, I don't think it's actually sung as a hymn anywhere, so it's more of a straight poem, um, but it definitely has hymnic qualities. And that is light shining out of darkness. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. I love that so much. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. So that's William Cooper. And then um, this one, this guy, he was like, um, what do you call it? Uh, a one-hit a one wonder, I guess. Um, I don't know of any other hymns or poet, poems by him that are widely read. He was, I believe, an Anglican minister. And this hymn that he wrote was very popular during the Regency times. So, and it has been my favorite for literally decades. I love this hymn so much. And that is Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eye strings break in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And that is um, written by Augustus Topley, was the man who wrote that poem. So, my three favorite Regency poems. And now three favorite historical events that happened in um, the Regency times, in the Regency era, um, in Britain or elsewhere. I'll mention two. 
One is the event that precipitated the Regency in the first place, which was the madness of King George. And of course, King George was the king, King George III, he was the king um, during the American Revolution. So that history is in, in England is very closely tied, obviously, to American history. And the madness of King George definitely affected, um, I think, the things that went on during the American Revolution, etc., to one extent or another. Um, and it's always been fascinating to me as an American. And um, so, yeah, I would say the madness of King George um, and his, his bouts of insanity and they had mental health has always fascinated me. Um, the precariousness of it and the causes of mental health and wellness or um, the lack of it, what causes things to go awry and the different ways they can go awry and the ways that it can be treated and ways that it can't be treated and should or should not be treated. The whole concept, the whole topic kind of fascinates me a little bit. Um, it's something that I find interesting. So that definitely is an interesting um, part of that time period that um, um, intrigues me, let's put it that way. And then another one is much closer to home for me personally, and that is um, the War of 1812 took place um, during the middle of all of this stuff going on um, with England and the Napoleonic Wars and all of that stuff. And um, it was kind of like, like America's final like assertion, I guess, of independence from Britain and, you know, staking our, our, our claim and securing our borders, etc. I don't know how else to put it. Um, and historians can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But, um, but in particular, what interests me about the War of 1812 is that is when our national anthem came into being, which um, happened very close to the home where I grew up in Maryland. And there is a fort in Maryland called Fort McHenry. And the War of 1812 um, kind of came to a climax there at Fort McHenry and it looked like on one night, I forget what the date it, the date was, I should know this, learned it in history class and I've been there on this date. <laughs> we like have a whole celebration and everything. Um, but as the song, as the national anthem describes, there was a great fight and um, the British ships were fighting from the sea against the fort which was on land and um, it looked like Fort McHenry would be lost because um, the cannons from the ships were just like seemed to be decimating the fort. But in the morning, the American flag was still standing and the fort was still standing and eventually the Americans won, obviously. And um, Frederick Scott Key happened to be on um, a ship, I believe as a reporter, I believe he was um, just observing and, and like reporting about the war. Um, I'm, now, I'm, now I, sh I should have looked this up before I started talking about this because like, oh yeah, I know this story, but now that I'm talking about it, I'm like, but are my facts remembered correctly? I'm not 100% sure. But at any rate, he was observing the battle and he was hoping and praying for the best, for the success of the Americans. And it inspired him to write the words to the Star Spangled Banner. And that became our national anthem, which, you know, some people disagree that it should be our national anthem because it's more about the flag than it is about the country itself but it's definitely still a, a stirring anthem and it's a great the tune is actually from um a popular opera tune of the day and it definitely requires a little bit of skill to sing it well and so it's kind of fun to hear like the different interpretations of it at you know like sports games and other events um that involve the singing of the national anthem and listening to different people's interpretations of it. And um, anyways, kind of fun. I like the national anthem and I like the story behind it. And I like that it ties closely to my home where I grew up. I have just some close ties to that. So that was kind of a long answer to that question. Uh, but those are my some of my favorite events that took place in the Regency era. Um, but one of them being more stateside. And then Number four, the year is 1816. It is a dark and stormy night on Lake Geneva. You're telling ghost stories with three legendary writers. Who are they? Bonus points if they're Regency era writers. So I'm gonna miss out on some of those bonus points, boo. But I had a hard time with this one because um, I don't read a lot of like 
scary stories or ghost stories or even thrillers or anything. Um, so I didn't have a lot, but I did come up with three. And the first one is Anne Radcliffe, which she's maybe not so much about ghosts, but definitely she, um, you know, she would write the Gothic stories and there always seem to be in Gothic stories, like an otherworldly element that usually turns out to be something, you know, very mundane or very human or creature or something. And, um, but it seems otherworldly at certain points in the story. And, uh, Anne Radcliffe, uh, I think I've, I've only read one book by her, um, but that was definitely the case in that story. And she definitely has a way of like creating a spooky setting and atmosphere that um, is not terrifying necessarily because, especially because like the language is is kind of dated for me as a modern reader. So it, it, it puts a little bit of distance between me and the story. So it's not as like scary as I think that it was to the people who read it when she wrote it. Um, but um, anyway, so Anne Radcliffe was the one that I thought of and her Gothic novels. And she did write in the Regency era, just prior, I think, to the Regency era, she was writing her works. And then Mary Shelley was definitely right in there in the, um, in the Regency era, era. And she is one of the authors that um, inspired this question with the circumstance, circumstances that led to the writing of Frankenstein, which is, of course, her major novel that she wrote and definitely a creepy story, which I have not actually read the actual book. Um, I mean, of course, I know the main idea of the story, but I've not actually read that book. I want to. It's like, I want to. I just don't gravitate toward that kind of story. But I know that it's a really important book and um, I do want to read it. Then the third one that I thought of was Henry James, because um, I've only read one um, ghost story by him, The Turn of the Screw. But whew, that was a stinker. So, yeah, I think he could definitely spin a yarn that would give you goosebumps all over. Number five, the Regency era is named after the Regency of George, Prince of Wales, who ruled in the stead of his father, King George III, from 1811 to 1820. If you had to appoint a regent to rule your booktube channel in your stead, who would it be? And... I thought of immediately of Miriam at Miriam Elizabeth Reads. I think we have very similar tastes in our reading. We're actually about to do a buddy read here in February. And um, she reads a, a great mix of classics and um, Christian fiction and um, other fiction. And uh, we just, we have very similar tastes. Not that we, we read exactly everything the same, but she comes the closest. And I think that she would have definitely um, continue to deliver recommendations and content that um, you all would enjoy, those of you who follow my channel. So I'm going to go with Miriam at Miriam Elizabeth Reads. And then, um, number six, much literature of the Regency period is categorized as romantic. What word would you use to describe today's literature? And I found the answers that the other people who did this tag very interesting. Some of them were very similar and some of them were almost the opposite. And um, I think that that actually um, <laughs> leads right to the word, the words that, that I thought of, <laughs> um, because I find it very difficult to pin down modern literature in any way, because much like our society and culture as a whole, especially, especially in Western culture, in Europe and, you know, the United States and Canada, et cetera, um, I find that the culture is very, very fractured and that you, the, the lines are, are drawn more strongly than ever between differing points of view. And from my perspective, it seems to be getting stronger every day. And I think that you can see that in the literature where you have um, each different subset of the population is writing literature from their perspective. And there's not a consensus anywhere. There's not a consensus across literature, um, across the whole of literature. And there are very few books that are able to bridge those, those strong divides. 
very few, very few pieces of literature are, are held up and praised by people across all, all sides of, you know, um, people across all different um, worldviews and um, thought paradigms and, and everything. Um, because just because we're all just, our views are just so different and often in opposition to one another. So um, the words that I came up with were, were fractured and or splintered, um, just because there's so many different subsets of literature that appeal to different subsets of the population. And uh, what is popular in one segment of the population is derided in the other and vice versa. So, um, and then the books that tend to be able to, to reach across to everyone Either they do that because one side is just choosing to ignore some things about it and just appreciate what is good about the story, um, but therefore not wholeheartedly loving it. Or the book is is um, just not really deeply engaged in grappling with issues um, so that there's nothing to really reject in it. So, and that sort of book, I feel like, would not be very lasting. Ironically, I think some of the literature that will survive this era of fracturedness is literature that reflects the nature of the fracturedness. And I think that that is some dystopian books. I think some dystopian books, um, like The Hunger Games, for example, I think they will um, persist as um, potential classics into the future and um, possibly some other dystopians because they reflect the, um, I don't know if despair is quite the right word, but um, they, they reflect the reality of the fractured nature of our society. And looking at, you know, if this, if this faction wins out, you know, this is the horrible way our world is going to look. And if that, action wins out, you know, this is the horrible way it's going to look like people looking into the future and saying, okay, what if that side um, rules everything and does it their way? What will it look like? And um, so I think like those books that will probably become classics in the future reflect that aspect of society. So that's my answer. Um, then number seven, Shakespeare's plays were popular during the Regency. What artistic performances have you recently enjoyed? Movies, TV, and music? Recently, I have been enjoying musicals. I got, I got to see several live um, performances last year of musicals. I've always loved musicals, but I love it even more if I get to see a live performance. So last year, I got to see Ragtime at a local production that was really phenomenally well done. It was excellent. And then I also got to see Fiddler on the Roof. Um, at a different local-ish production. And that was also very good. I enjoyed that very much. And then last summer, my husband and I went up to New York and we saw Parade, um, which Ben Platt was starring in, which was really great to see. Fantastic show. Amazing. There wasn't a bad singer in that whole cast. And I love the story. Um, that's why I'm reading The Dead Shall Rise by Steve Oney, because it is about the crime that happens, that that musical is about. So, um, I really enjoyed seeing all of those performances. I always love musicals and, um, yeah, that's my favorite. Then number eight, the Regency period was characterized by high fashion. What is a current fashion or trend in the book community that you adore or detest? Well, the truth is those are really strong words, adore and detest. Uh, um, I basically, I really just don't care about trends. I'm just not a trendy person. And, um, I tend to only latch on to a trend if it becomes something more like that sticks around a little bit longer. Um, and so I'm honestly fairly unaware of um, trends within the book community um, or whatever. I also read a lot of older things and um, I'm not really, I don't really follow necessarily like the really hip booktubers or other Instagram or channels and I'm not on TikTok at all, which I know is highly influential right now. Well, I, I can't say that I adore or detest or dislike or anything like that. I, I don't have necessarily negative feelings about it, but I watch with interest <laughs> and occasionally amusement. 
at the influence that TikTok has on culture as a whole and the video clips that people make on there that are able to influence people's buying um, choices and their reading choices and their music choices, etc. Um, sometimes without a, a great deal of, of sense involved. And it's just, I just watch with amusement sometimes how the, the, the mob mentality takes over and uh, people just all of a sudden read a book that's been around for 10 or 15 years and they never cared to pick it up before, but all of a sudden because a certain influencer says it's, a, you know, it raves about the book, then all of a sudden they want to read it. And so then they read it and everybody loves it and then it just goes around and everybody loves it all of a sudden. And maybe it is a really amazing book that deserves to be brought to the public's attention. I don't know. I haven't really picked up on any of those trends myself. Like I said, not a trendy person. Um, and then finally, um, not finally, but the next one, number eight. No, number nine. This is finally. Yes. Jane Austen's novels show us the importance of etiquette in the drawing rooms of Regency England. Tell us about your personal rating system. So basically everybody else who answered this question has said that they have based more or less abandoned the star rating system or percentage rating system um, for one reason or another. And there are definitely in flaws inherent in any rating system. Uh, but I think because I have been a teacher for my entire adult life, I have no trouble. <laughs> I have no trouble rating things and giving them a grade. Um, I think actually, even though it's there's there's no way to have a perfect system, there are always going to be flaws inherent in any system that you choose. Um, I do think it's very helpful because by and large, if everyone is giving four and five stars to a book, it's probably not going to be a waste of your time. Um, now that might not be true if it's, let's say it's, it's a high fantasy novel and you're not into that, but everybody who is loves it and gives it a four or five. So, you know, if you like that sort of genre, then you'll probably really like that book. Um, same thing with like, you know, a romantic comedy or something like that. Uh, so if a lot of people are giving it four and five stars, there's a good chance that it's probably going to be good and it's going to be well written and you'll probably enjoy that book. Um, at the same time, I find that negative ratings, I, I always look at the negative ratings. If there's a book I'm unsure about, I look at the negative ratings and see why did people not like this book. And the negative ratings really help me to um, know if I should read the book or not. And I, so I specifically look for the one and two stars on Goodreads and I read what people are saying in their one and two stars. And based on what they say, I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll probably like this book because I would like the things that they hate or vice versa. Oh yeah, I wouldn't like that at all. So I'm not going to bother with that book. So, um, I think ratings are actually very helpful. So my rating system is, um, it, despite the fact that admittedly it's, it's inherently a flawed system and there's not any way to fix it. So I understand why people don't want to use ratings, but I'm used to the nature of rating and grading things. So it doesn't bother me at all. Um, so on a scale of one to five, typically I just use Goodreads um, rating system for the most part. When I'm on Storygraph, they, li they let you give um, like 4.25 or 4.5, 4.75, etc. So they let you break it down a little bit by quarters. And so I will make use of that on Storygraph. Um, and I will also often note in my Goodreads review, like if I gave something four stars, but I didn't feel like it was fully a four star, like there were maybe just some other flaws with it. I will put in my review three and a half stars. Um, or if I think it's actually worth a little more, but it's not quite a five, I'll put four and a half stars on there. Um, so I, you know, I work with the system the best that I can. And I always try in my reviews to be really clear about what I liked about each book and what I disliked about each book to explain my rating. I find it frustrating when people give a book like two or three stars on Goodreads, but then there's nothing in the review that indicates what they did not like about it or vice versa. I've seen a couple four and five star reviews where from the review, you would think that they actually didn't like it because they're just pointing out any flaw that they saw, but they're not saying what they loved about it. So anyway, um, I try to really be clear in my reviews to back up the ratings as to why I felt one way or the other. Um, I reserve five stars for books that stick out above the rest. Um, I try to be, I go back and forth on this. This is, this is one of the flaws. Like 
most of the time I reserve five stars for really, really well-written, more literary type books. And which means that, you know, a rom-com, for example, it has to be like really, 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 really super stellar for me to give a five, but I'm probably not going to. I'm probably just going to give it a four regardless. If it is a, a formulaic book of any kind, it's probably not gonna get a five from me, even if I enjoy it a lot, and even if it stands out above the rest. Now, is that fair? Um, if a rom-com is like the best of all rom-coms, should it get a five? Probably, so that is a flaw. Um, it's not a perfect system, but I tend to reserve five stars for the books that I feel I will read again because they were so good at some point, maybe like not that I will not that I'm promising to read it again, but it's a book that I would read again, um, that I would want to read again at some point that I feel is worth a reread. Um, and books that just really are memorable, like they stick in my mind and I can remember things about them. Those are the ones that I give five stars. Four stars means a book was really good and I really enjoyed it. Um, it just doesn't like rise up to legendary status for me. Um, so I don't have as, I don't have as many five star books as some booktubers do for that reason. I, I just really save them for really special books. And most of the books I read, I probably give them four stars, um, or three stars. In 2023, I gave more four stars than anything. Um, I also like to give three stars. Three star just means it was good. It wasn't horrible. There wasn't anything that I strongly disliked about it. I enjoyed the reading of it, but it wasn't my favorite at all. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it just wasn't, I can, I could have lived without reading it, but I'm glad I read it. And then anything that I give two stars is like, there were things I strongly disliked about it and um, I'm not necessarily recommending it. I don't really give one stars. If I gave a one star, it would be because I DNF'd it. But, um, and I go back and forth on that. I feel like, like some people I say, if you DNF a book, you shouldn't rate it. And I get what they're saying. At the same time, if a book was so awful that you couldn't finish it, I mean, to me, that's a one star, right? But I just leave those unrated. And I just, um, sometimes I, I'll say if, that I DNF'd it, if depending on what it is and how far I got into the book. Um, and, um, if I, if I get to a certain point in the book and then I DNF it, but I kind of like just skim it to the end, in that case, I may give it like one star. Um, but typically speaking, if, if a book is going to get one star for me, I'm not going to waste my time on it anymore. I'm just going to DNF it and not finish it. So, so I am going to finish up by tagging some people to do the Feb Regency tag. Um, as far as I know, uh, Kate Howe and Amy of uh, Amy Partridge have not done the Feb Regency tag, and I would love to see their videos of this, so I'm going to tag them. Thank you for watching, and I hope you are enjoying Feb Regency with us, and I would invite you in the comments to tell me um, what your answers would be to some of these questions, and who are your favorite Regency authors or poets, historic events, um, what sort of um, uh, musical and dramatic art have you been enjoying lately that you would care to share about in the comments and any other thoughts you have about my rating system or trends in the book community, anything. Um, share in the conversation, that's the best part, in the comments below. And oh, by the way, I meant to say this at the beginning, but just throw this here at the end. Um, I actually had filmed and prepared a totally different video for today, but then Dia tagged me in this and I wanted to get it out because it's a little bit, I, I wanted to get it done earlier rather than later in February. So next Wednesday um, will be the next installment of my Books Are Like Coffee episodes and I will be tackling epistolary novels. So that will be coming up next Wednesday. And in the meantime, have a great week. Talk to you next time. Bye.